Good morning. I'm Pastor Bruce Anderson of First United Methodist Church of West Chicago. We have recently merged with Winfield Community United Methodist Church and we'll be voting on a new name. Um, hopefully you've gotten the letter explaining this and the, the ballot for what the final name will be. Please return that. Um, you can either bring it to the church and drop it off in person or mail it in. But uh, please get your vote back in for the new name. We are currently in the midst of our Bible study, Lent in Plain Sight. And we meet on Wednesday evenings with a 5.30 supper at church, followed by a 6 o'clock study. So we hope to see you there. We are also doing um, 40 days of prayer, and that is at noon every day. There's a bookmark with prayer topics on there um, that you can pick up at the church. And we ask that you just take a moment um, at noon every day and join us wherever you are in prayer for the world. Um, welcome, and we hope that you enjoy worshiping with us this week.
We come into our time of prayer together. Would you join me in praying? Dear Lord, we pray for the needs of all your people here in your creation. We especially pray for those who are suffering from war and violence uh, in their countries and cities, and we pray that they will find what they need to maintain their lives and their families. Also be with those who are displaced and affected by natural disasters, the uh, heavy snowstorms that have come across the United States the last couple of weeks, the um, earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, and the, the flooding and drought and just all the natural disasters that are going on across your creation. Lord, help your people be up to the task to helping our brother and sisters find what they need to survive, places to stay, food to eat, and clothing to wear. Lord, I pray that you will reach out and touch each and every one of us at our point of deepest need, for you know even before we come to you, what our real needs are. And we pray that, pray that you will bless us according to your grace and mercy. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 17 through 25. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews ask for signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. What do you think of when you see a cross? It's become synonymous with Christianity, so... That is usually what comes to mind immediately for most people. But that's not what it meant for people in the first century, around the time when Jesus lived. For them, it was a symbol of terror used by the Roman government to keep people in line. It meant a long, slow, painful death by asphyxiation for whoever was sentenced to death in that manner. The weight of the body hanging by the arms would put pressure on the chest and abdomen, making it difficult to breathe. One could use one's legs for a while to take some of the pressure off and breathe easy, but after a while the legs' m muscles would tire, and the person would not be able to use them as long. And the longer one was on the cross, the longer were the stretches where the legs were ineffective, and breathing became more and more difficult which led to less and less strength left for the person to maintain their ability to breathe until exhausted. The person would succumb to the inevitable and die from asphyxiation. The person would, of course, be aware of what was happening right up until the bitter end. The terror and helplessness of knowing what was happening would have been as bad or maybe worse than the death itself. That is why it was such an effective deterrent. And those who died in such a manner were considered cursed by God. As Paul reminds us in Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Catholics keep Jesus' death in the forefront of their theology by worshiping Christ on the cross with the crucifix. But to me, that is focusing on Christ's suffering to the detriment of the resurrection. It's not by Christ's suffering and death that we are saved, for that happened to hundreds, if not thousands of people. It's through the resurrection that we are saved. God's reversal of sinful humanity's errant judgment of Jesus that resulted in his death sentence. The resurrection was a repudiation of the sinful worship structure that favored the elites over the common people and kept them separated from God. You may remember the three gospel accounts of Jesus' death that tell us the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The curtain of the temple separated the Holy of Holies, containing the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence, from the worshipers. At Christ's death, that division was torn away by God from top to bottom, so there could be no mistake about who had done it. He had done it to allow people direct access to God through Christ. No more would we need the mediation of a priest to come into the presence of God in worship or in prayer because of Christ's selfless sacrifice on humanity's behalf. 
That's why Protestants worship the empty cross, symbolizing Christ's resurrection and overcoming of sin, suffering, and death. Part of the Christian journey is trying to replicate some of Christ's selflessness on behalf of others. As Jill Duffield reminds us in our Lenten devotional, looking to the joy before him, Jesus endured the cross. Jesus, the one who pioneered and perfects our faith, disregarded the shame and torture of the cross and now sits in glory at the right hand of God. Reverend Brett Blair shares a story of people enduring trials and tribulation on behalf of others that illustrates a bit of this sort of sacrifice for others. In January 1926, six-year-old Richard Stanley showed symptoms of diphtheria, signaling the possibility of an outbreak in the small town of Nome, Alaska. When the boy passed away a day later, Dr. Curtis Welsh began immunizing children and adults with an experimental but effective anti-diphtheria serum. But it wasn't long before Dr. Welch's supply ran out, and the nearest serum was in Nanana, Alaska, 1,000 miles of frozen wilderness away. Amazingly, a group of trappers and prospectors volunteered to cover the distance with their dog sleds. Operating in relays from trading post to trapping station and beyond, one sled started out from Nome, while another, carrying the supply of serum, started from Nanana. The plan was to meet in the middle and cut the delivery time in half. Unmindful of frostbite fatigue and exhaustion, the Teamsters mushed relentlessly until after 144 hours, in minus 50 degree wind chill, the serum was delivered to Nome. As a result, the only other death was lost to only one other death happened due to the potential epidemic. Their sacrifice had given an entire town the gift of life. As a result, to memorialize this heroic event, Every year in Alaska, a 1,000-mile dog sled race, the Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race, is run for prize money and prestige. Its running commemorates that original race to save lives. In Christian communion, we commemorate another mission, the journey of Christ from Pilate's prison to the hill on which he died to save our lives from the tyranny of sin, death, disease, hatred, loneliness. The list is endless, and the race isn't over. That cross, our Lord's finish line, has become our mission and the symbol of our faith. His cross has become our cross. Take up the cross and let us, his church, finish the race. In Mark, Jesus tells us, If any wish to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Joel Duffield reminds us, The sequence of our discipleship begins with self-denial, then taking up our cross and journeying in Christ's footsteps. But how do we take up our cross, so to speak? Again, Jill Duffield tells us, we do so by looking past our self-interests on behalf of the vulnerable oppressed, marginalized and fearful, working for justice and being just, loving kindness and being kind, and walking humbly as we follow Jesus, makes for a life of purpose and joy, strangely synonymous with self-denial and cross-bearing. We do it by giving our time and resources to institutions such as PADS, the Neighborhood Food Pantry, and UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, that is active around the world supporting people in need in places suffering from war and natural disaster, such as Ukraine, Turkey, and Syria. We do so by helping our neighbors with things that they need, both 
large and small. And we do it by contributing our time, talents, gifts, service, and witness to our church. By being walking, talking examples of Christian living in our everyday lives for all to see. We do so by our witness. Jesus Christ was sentenced to death on the cross for witnessing to the true kingdom of God in a fallen world filled with selfishness and idolatry. And God reversed that sentence through Christ's resurrection. There are still places in the world where being a Christian can result in prison or even death, places such as China and many Muslim countries. If we were to be charged today with being Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict us? I certainly hope so, for that is what being a Christian is supposed to be all about, living out and witnessing to our faith in order to draw others to also become disciples of Christ Jesus. So, let us take the remainder of these 40 days of Lent to search ourselves to see where we might be falling short of our call to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I mean, who would deny their own self-interest on behalf of others? That is foolishness indeed. It is only those who are being saved as followers of Christ who would do that by the power of God. Those who look past the power and call of consumerism to see the true power and love of God displayed on the empty cross. May we all take up our crosses and follow the path of Christ Jesus to bring the kingdom of God just a little bit closer to those we meet. May it be so for you and for me. Amen.
Our church is sustained through this wilderness time by your faithful generosity. You can continue to send your offerings by mail, or for more information about setting up an electronic funds transfer, contact Roberta Kent or Pastor Abney. we go forth into the world this week, may we take up the cross of Christ and share the love and compassion of God with a hurting world. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen.